Hi everyone, uh, welcome to today's session on modern slavery legislation. For those who don't know me, my name is Julia Cambage and I am the CEO of the Australian Institute of Architects. I don't get to do lean-ins very often, but I'm excited to be with you today. And I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we all meet and wherever you are. I pay my respect to their elders, past, present and emerging, and I acknowledge their unceded sovereign rights. I'm actually speaking to you today from Peyote Nation in Nevada in the USA. Thanks very much to all of you who've chosen to attend today. Uh, and we really welcome you to this session, which is a really important one. We have members and also some suppliers here. So welcome to, to both sets of attendees. The purpose of today is to raise the level of awareness across the profession of the potential impact businesses have on human rights. Scrutiny of business practices has been increasing over the past two decades and is gaining momentum globally. Businesses are coming under increasing pressure to be transparent about how they are assessing and addressing risk to people in their operations and extended supply change. Georgia today will provide an overview of the modern slavery legislation, how it impacts product, manufacturers, client expectation product procurement for architects. Plus, there'll also be an overview on how we are addressing modern slavery via our products and materials library, which is going to launch in late October, and, and Amanda is going to run us through that. To start off, I'd like to uh, welcome and introduce Georgia Marjorie Banks, who's a senior associate at Morrissey Law and Advisory. The team at Morrissey Law and Advisory has helped several clients in the construction industry to prepare their own modern slavery policies and meet their annual reporting obligations. Prior to Georgia's current role at Morrissey Law and Advisory, she's been a on secondment with the in-house legal team at the Port of Newcastle while they were reviewing their procurement strategies and preparing their first modern slavery reports. Georgia calls on her extensive experience in commercial law and major projects to work with businesses of all sizes, helping them to promote their companies and achieve their commercial goals. She provides legal training to corporate teams, startup incubators, and community service providers, and has been a guest lecturer for the College of Law at the Australian National University and Macquarie, Macquarie University's incubator program. Uh, I'm sure it's going to be an insightful uh, session and uh, I will refer you to the chat room. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to pop them in there and we'll be running through questions at the end. I'll hand over to Georgia and let's get going. All right. Thank you so much, Julia. And, and thanks, everyone, for the opportunity to speak today. It's always really encouraging to uh, see industry being so proactive about issues like modern slavery and, and doing their part. So let's get started. We'll have a look at our agenda for today. So to begin with, um, goal number one is to talk about what modern slavery is, how it shows up in Australian society and in the supply chains um, that we're all involved in. Second, we'll take a look at modern slavery legislation in Australia right now. And we'll start off with what you need to know about the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Act that's in force at the moment. Uh, then I'll give you a bit of a snapshot about new laws that are on the horizon for businesses operating uh, or engaging with customers in New South Wales. After that, we'll take a look at the reporting obligations that might apply to your own businesses, either on a compulsory or a voluntary basis. Uh, then the, the third topic that we'll look into is the competing expectations that you might start coming across from your clients, your suppliers, your investors, uh, and other stakeholders in your business. And I'll share some examples there about where I'm seeing modern slavery issues arise in the world of construction and design services. Then finally, I'll give some pointers on what you and your business can be doing uh, to keep up with all of the changes in modern slavery legislation here in Australia and abroad. Uh, and that section should lead in really nicely to Amanda's presentation where she'll run through the new products and materials library, uh, which should have some really good resources in there to help you keep on top of your own procurement and compliance issues. So let's dive on in. What is modern slavery? 
Essentially, modern slavery is an umbrella term that applies to a range of different human rights abuses that affect adults and children. Uh, the modern aspect is sort of a recognition of the fact that the institution of slavery today may look different to some of our historical understandings, but the essence is still the same. So in most United Nations documents and national legislation on this topic, you'll see that umbrella term modern slavery used to refer to a series of different practices, including slavery, where one person purports to exercise a power of ownership and control over another. Human trafficking are often where a person's brought into a situation of exploitation through coercion or deceptive recruitment. Uh, forced and compulsory labour, where work and services are being undertaken um, in a way that's not voluntary and often involves threats and punishment. Um, and then another category is bonded labour, where work or services are demanded theoretically in repayment of a debt, but the size of that debt and the duration of the services are not clearly defined and those arrangements can go on for years and decades. So in all of these cases, a person's forced to work under threat, they're controlled by other people, they're dehumanised, treated as commodities, and they're not free to leave. So um, it's an offence under Australian law to engage in slavery or to be involved in commercial transactions involving slaves. That's been the case for quite a long time. But this new approach to modern slavery uh, that we'll focus on today is a more recent development. So let's take a look at how common modern slavery is in Australia. And it's a difficult thing to estimate, but the International Labour Organization suggests that there are more than 40 million people in modern slavery-like conditions worldwide today. Um, if you drill down to the Australian stats, they estimate that around 15,000 people are being kept in slave-like conditions in Australia now. Um, as I said, those estimates are difficult um, to make because while I was looking for current stats, I saw that the Australian Institute of Criminology suggests that only one in five victims of modern slavery are ever identified and reported and, and show up in these statistics. So the stats that are on that slide there come from the Australian Federal Police. Uh, and this is part of a report that they made to Parliament when the current legislation was being developed. So what it shows is that in the period from 2013 through to 2017, the Australian Federal Police received almost 500 referrals for human trafficking and slavery offences uh, in Australia. If you look at the graph, the, the majority of those referrals related to forced marriage and sexual exploitation. But then that third category there, labour exploitation, is the kind of thing that shows up in modern supply chains and can be quite difficult um, to identify in some cases. So if I step away from the, the statistics for a moment and take a look at how these issues play out in real lives, um, I'll share with you a case study from Wales um, because the legislation over in the UK came into force a bit earlier. It's often easier to come across case studies there. So in this particular scenario, uh, a gentleman moved from Scotland to Wales uh, in the late 80s looking for labouring work. He was offered a role with an ash belting company uh, and told that he would ex receive accommodation and food in exchange for his labour. Um, it didn't quite turn out like that. The accommodation turned out to be a shed at the back of an ash belting company and instead of being paid in um, sensible amounts of food, he was lucky if he'd get cigarettes or, or spare change each day. Um, and this situation lasted almost 20 years in his case. Um, he made some unsuccessful escape attempts for which he would be punished. Uh, and it wasn't until the Modern Slavery Act came into place in the UK and it was a topic being discussed in the media quite prevalently that he was able to reach out to local police and get out of that situation. Um, and in that particular case, the operator of the Ashfelting Company who had um, or nominally employed him but, but treated him and placed him in those slavery-like conditions was actually jailed for that conduct. So in that scenario, we can't know whether other workers on those construction sites knew about his situation. We don't know if the businesses who involved that Ashfelding Company knew what was going on. 
Um, we don't know if that company was winning more tenders because they were able to undercut their competitors' prices. Um, so I just wanted to bring that one up as an example of how these things can play out almost in plain sight in the construction industry in different times. So um, the policy goal behind modern slavery legislation is to encourage everyone involved in that scenario to have a greater awareness uh, of the red flags that might come up and to be responsive to situations where people may be being exploited or placed in slavery-like conditions. Um, the final point on that slide, just note some of the highest risk products globally. Um, the Global Slavery Index is uh, an index published each year, but they have flagged that the production of things like laptop computers, mobile phones, clothing, um, and some raw materials are the areas where we see the highest risk of slavery-like conditions um, down the supply chain. Okay, so we'll move on and have a look at the legislation um, and the timeline for how we reached the place that we are in now. So slavery has been an offence in Australia since 1824 when the United Kingdom legislated to abolish slavery. Since then, particularly in the 80s and 90s, international bodies like the United Nations and the International Labour Organization have passed a series of conventions and protocols which set out the international law around slavery. So different countries then adopted the principles from those international instruments and brought them into their own national law in different ways. Uh, the UK's Modern Slavery Act came in in 2015 uh, and we use that act as a model for our legislation here in Australia. We move along this timeline in 2018. Modern Slavery Acts passed through both federal and New South Wales parliaments uh, and the federal act commenced and started operating in 2019. But the New South Wales Act was put on hold pending further consultation and amendment. I'll go into a little bit more detail about what the difference is between those two acts shortly, but the, the takeaway here is the Commonwealth one is in force now. Uh, the New South Wales one is still working its way uh, through Parliament. In 2020, that legislation in New South Wales went out for public consultation and review. Parliamentary committees have been looking at it. The government's made its own reports. And initially that legislation was sort of set to come into play in January this year, but since uh, the COVID pandemic hit, that, that legislation hasn't been given the same priority. So we're sort of left watching this space right now uh, with the Commonwealth legislation being the only one in force. So what does that common le Commonwealth legislation actually say? Um, We'll begin with looking at who the Commonwealth Modern Slavery Act applies to. So it applies to entities that are one, based in or operating in Australia, and two, have an annual consolidated revenue of more than $100 million. So if your business ticks both those boxes, you will have annual reporting obligations, which I'll go through shortly. Uh, each year, you need to report to the federal government on all the things listed at the bottom of that slide. You need to tell them about the modern slavery risks that are associated with your business and the supply chains that you use. You need to be talking about the actions that you're taking or will take to mitigate the risks that you've identified. Uh, you need to report on any training that you're giving to staff around this issue and any other information you want to shout from the rooftops um, about how proactive you're being in this space. So the document that reports on all those things is called a modern slavery statement. At the moment, uh, if you are required to submit a statement and you don't, uh, the minister responsible for this process can sort of publicly name and shame your organisation but there's no financial penalties that are imposed at this stage. So the reputational risk is quite high, but you're not getting fined under the Commonwealth Act. The next point to note is that $100 million threshold is quite high. There are plenty of businesses uh, which would love to be turned over each year, but aren't quite at that financial threshold. So if that's you, you're not obliged to submit a modern slavery statement every year, but you can still do so voluntarily. 
Um, and the team at Morrissey is seeing more and more of our clients taking this step. Um, and everybody's got different motivations to voluntarily jump through another, another hoop. Um, some people are doing it because they want to be good corporate citizens. They want to be proactive in this space um, and, and signal their interests and their intentions um, and the conduct that they expect from the supply chains they're involved in. Um, others are approaching it from the perspective that this is new legislation that's being tested out um, on the biggest companies in the country and that it's likely that over time the reporting obligations might filter down uh, to smaller and smaller businesses and they just want to make sure they have their processes in place now. So Commonwealth legislation, if you meet that financial threshold, you need to submit your annual report. If you don't, you can choose to submit voluntarily. That's the Commonwealth legislation. We'll now move on to this New South Wales legislation, which is not in force yet and still working its way through the parliamentary system. If it was adopted in its current form, the New South Wales Act would apply to more businesses and it would impose tougher penalties on failure to report. So the financial threshold in the Commonwealth Act is $100 million of consolidated revenue. The threshold in New South Wales is half that, so $50 million of consolidated revenue. And again, it would have that same provision for people to voluntarily report if they choose to do so. Under the New South Wales Act, there's also penalties of up to $1.1 million if reporting obligations are not met. And those fines could be imposed in situations where you're obliged to submit a modern slavery statement and you don't do it, or where you're obliged to submit that statement and you put false and misleading information into it. So if that New South Wales Act did come into force, it would still capture businesses with headquarters and operations outside of New South Wales if some operations and services were being uh, delivered and taking place in New South Wales. And that arrangement works for legislation in other countries too. So if your services are starting to expand into different jurisdictions, you may want different modern slavery acts that you'll need to comply with. So as an example, uh, one of our design clients operates across Australia and the UK. And the approach that they're taking is to prepare a statement for the whole corporate group in both countries and they make sure that their statement ticks all the regulatory boxes under the Australian Act and the British Act, uh, which sounds like a lot of work, but the good news is that because all the legislation is based on the same underlying international laws, there's a lot of overlap. Okay, I just wanted to show you briefly the fact that modern slavery statements are publicly available. At the moment, the federal government's publishing them on the Australian Border Force website. And what you can see on the screen there is just a screenshot of a few different businesses in the construction industry who have submitted statements this year. Um, if you throw into Google modern slavery register, uh, you'll be able to reach the same page uh, and you can search the register by uh, industry or the size of a business or, or a bunch of other metrics. So it's um, definitely worth, if you have a little bit of time, having a look for what the others in your uh, area and industry are doing just to get a feel for what's going on. Um, in some cases, the statements are just a couple of pages of text. They're really simple. Um, others like this uh, graphic in red here from the John Holland Group can be quite a glossy document that goes into quite a lot of detail um, about operations all over Australia uh, and beyond. Okay, so I've told you that only some businesses have to submit annual modern slavery statements, but then I've also said that more and more businesses are making reports voluntarily. So I take that as a sign that the public pressure is really building on this issue and that uh, businesses who aren't seen to be taking action are behind the curve. So I just wanted to have a look at where this pressure is coming from. And there's a few different sources and it'll be different for each of you on the call today. So consumers, let's start there. Consumers are becoming more and more selective in the services that they seek out and the products they consume. There's a fundamental ethical drive to stamp out slavery in all its forms. And in an increasingly globalised world where we're all seeking to fast more efficient supply chains, 
we need to be really conscious of the consequences of a, a race to the bottom. So from the consumer side, you're getting pressure to provide cost-effective services, but consumers are also making decisions um, based on their own ethical positions. So keep that in mind. Then if we move across to investors, investors are also putting their money behind businesses who are really serious about combating modern slavery, as opposed to just ticking another regulatory box. So in November last year, a coalition of uh, really powerful investors, including Australian Super, CBUS, Hester, Ausbill, and First Centier Investments. Um, that's a group who together control almost $4.9 trillion uh, of assets under management. They got together and wrote to the 100 largest companies on the Australian Stock Exchange uh, and essentially said in their letter, that these companies need to take the risks of modern slavery and human trafficking seriously. Uh, and if that investor group formed the view that they weren't, then that enormous pool of assets would be going elsewhere. Then we'll move on to principals and subcontractors. So as um, Julia mentioned, the team at Morrissey does quite a lot of work in the construction industry. And we're starting to see modern slavery clauses pop up in everything from minor works contracts to uh, professional services contracts and architectural design. So I think that's happening because everyone in the supply is under more pressure to mitigate modern slavery risks. Um, and often principals will add clauses into design and construct contracts and, and similar agreements, which require their business partners to train their staff and to disclose modern slavery risks. Uh, because often, subcontractors and others in the supply chain are going to have more visibility over some of those red flags than a, a principal standing at the top of the chain. So I think those trends of um, plugging modern slavery clauses and obligations into those kinds of agreements is only going to continue. Then finally, the overall global trend in that timeline earlier, I showed you the move from international instruments through to different countries imposing um, their own modern slavery acts. Plenty of countries are, are on that pathway now. So as I mentioned before, if you're providing services or obtaining goods or labour from outside Australia, the chances are that you're going to be caught by modern slavery rules from overseas as well as the ones that apply here in Australia. So as I mentioned, there's a lot of overlap, so it shouldn't be too daunting to think about complying with all different sets of rules because they're, they're almost the same in each case. Um, but yeah, as we sort of live in this globalised world, the pressure's mounting here in Australia and overseas as well. So what can you do to combat modern slavery in your own supply chains? Sorry, all right, we're back. <laughs> what can you be doing to combat modern slavery in your own supply chain? So we've got a long list here, and that's not because I think you all need to drop everything and implement the entire list. Um, it should be more of a, a menu that you can use to choose the actions that are going to work for you and the businesses that you're a part of. So number one, you can prepare a modern slavery statement for the current year. Maybe you have to submit one because your annual revenue is over that $100 million threshold, uh, but maybe you're going to make a voluntary report. If you're not ready to take that step just yet, um, a good place to start might be jumping onto the online register and just getting a feel for what other businesses are doing and what's out there. Uh, menu item number two is a modern slavery policy. So again, a lot of the clients that I work with day to day are adopting modern slavery policies and they're documents that set out how that business is going to deal with modern slavery risks. The policies are made available to all employees and are sometimes published on company websites and they sit alongside other policies about everything from sustainability practices through to annual leave. Um, they're especially important if you do have those mandatory reporting obligations because they allow you to put a framework in place that'll make your annual reports easier to manage when the time comes around each year. The third suggestion I've got up there is that if this topic is still relatively new for your business, it's really worthwhile putting a briefing paper together for the board of directors um, that you work with. And that paper might set out the state of play now, the legislative changes that may be coming in New South Wales and different resources that the company might be able to, um, to utilise to help them with compliance. Um, 
So the, the products library that we're going to look at shortly might be one of those resources that could be really helpful. Um, and if I can take a slight detour and throw in another anecdote, um, Julia mentioned that I had been working uh, in the maritime and logistics industry on a secondment recently. And the board of the company that I worked with had a standing item on their board meeting agenda for modern slavery. So the idea was each time the directors came together, they'd turn their mind to this issue and just take note of any red flags that might've come up during business operations. Um, and that meant the issue was really front of mind for them when the COVID pandemic hit. Um, and I remember news reports at that point in time about sailors and ships being stranded outside of ports who couldn't get in um, because of quarantine rules and were sort of stuck for weeks and months at a time in some cases. So while the plight of those sailors wasn't necessarily a form of slavery, the board was alert to issues about well-being of um, the, the labour force that was sort of using their resources and it meant that they were able to mobilise community resources and get provisions and even Wi-Fi connections out to the people stranded on those ships. So it can have benefits outside of this very specific reporting regime as well. The next item on that list is contractual protection. So again, um, we're seeing more and more of these come up in um, the construction industry. It's worth hitting control F, searching for modern slavery on any new contracts that come across your desk at the moment. Uh, and it's also worth just considering whether you'd like to include provisions in your own standard terms and agreements, um, just to try and explain to your business partners what your expectations are on this issue. And in some cases, pass some obligations on to them to be monitoring what's going on in the supply chain, because as I mentioned before, they may have more visibility than, than you do over some aspects of the workforce um, and the supply chain. Then we've got training for staff. That's one of the topics that you need to be mentioning in your modern slavery statements. Um, and the policy goal behind that is that the more people in your organisation who are alert to modern slavery issues, the more likely it is that you're going to pick up those red flags um, and send them up the line. Um, and then the next tip there is to assess the risks in your particular supply chain. So we could probably do a whole separate presentation on that process, so I'll keep it brief here. Um, and Amanda's going to run through some tools that might also help here. But my recommendation is to set aside some time and consider where the risks lie for you. Which products do you use um, that might have higher risks? Are there prices somewhere along the line that seem too good to be true? Are the business partners that you're engaging with really proactive about modern slavery risks or, or is it a bit of a journey that you all need to go on together? Um, and what tools do you have at your disposal to notice red flags? And what tools could you put in place to help you in the future? And that leads into the final point, which is to start developing a playbook. So at a strategic level, have conversations about who in your organisation is going to be responsible for monitoring these types of risks and how they're going to raise the flag if they do come across any issues. Um, think about what you're going to do if you find that suppliers are not meeting your standards. So if we go back to that case study of the um, gentleman working in the Ashfelting company in Wales who was subjected to that awful treatment, in that case, simply terminating the contracts with the Ashfelting company may be a way to sort of cut that issue out of your supply chain, but there's a risk that that step may even put vulnerable people more at risk. So there's, there's complicated decisions to be made in a lot of these situations, and often it's easier to have conversations about how you'd like to manage things in this hypothetical stage rather than when you're so the more you can raise the issues talk about it and think about how they could play out for you um will all really help you deal with um situations if they arise which i hope they don't um, some of you might have other actions that you would add to that list and i'd love to hear about them uh, in the chat at the end but for now I'm going to hand back over to Julia and Amanda so they can tell you about some resources that might help you keep on top of these things. Thank you so much Georgia it's a really great start for us and what I will say to everyone is that into the future I'm sure that we'll actually look at, at running some further CPD uh, around this and 
and looking at how we can actually support practice um, to, to work in this space if they're choosing to. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hand over now to Amanda. And Amanda joined the Institute uh, this year in our Marketing and, and Business Insights, uh, and she's the lead of that group. Her role is primarily um, on developing new products and services for the Institute and its members. And uh, she's going to introduce our new platform to you, which is actually working to provide some transparency around supply chain. And, and she will speak more about herself and also talk to our products and materials library. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you, Julia. And thank you also to Georgia for a wonderful presentation. Um, as Julia mentioned, um, my name's Amanda Jennings. I'm the Marketing and Business Insights Lead here at the Institute. My role primarily is project-based, focused around providing new products and services for our members and providers. So today I'm here to talk about a new tool which will help with supply chain transparency for our members. Many Australian supply chains lead directly to the Asia Pacific region, where it's estimated there are over 30 million people in human trafficking, forced labour or debt bondage situations. Businesses need to be aware of modern slavery and embrace greater visibility and transparency in product manufacturing and product procurement. Complexities can arise when products require a high quantity of materials resulting in multi-tiered supply chains. This can lead to a lack of visibility and control over your suppliers and your subcontractors. Effective management of modern slavery involves placing the human rights risks at the heart of your business and your decision making. Once a plan is in place, this will assist in preventing harm to people, manage your business risks and your business reputation and help meet your client expectations. So our new platform that we're launching in late October will assist with supply chain transparency, putting human rights risks, sustainability and conformity at the forefront of product procurement. Our products and materials library is designed to provide an easy, easy to access online catalog to search and save products, materials and fixtures for our members projects. All products listed must conform with appropriate Australian standards and comply with the requirements of the NCC to ensure our members have a trusted and reputable source of providers to work with. We have the inclusion of sustainability certifications and modern slavery registered tags that will assist in finding a solution to meet procurement and specification requirements. In consultation with our policy team, we've developed the following certification tags and registers on this page. Our aim is to continue to grow this over time with our product manufacturers and also with our members and to ensure that we have a constant stream of communication with our members to ensure that everything that we're developing and, and um, growing within this platform is meeting the needs of product procurement so that you have one place to go to be able to search for all the things relevant for your projects. This service will be available to Australian Institute of Architect members in our community platform which launched late last year. So it's a member only platform, which is designed to facilitate collaboration, member connectivity and generate ideas and discussions. So for those who aren't members on the call today, um, this area was launched late last year. We currently have three areas of community, which um, were, the first area is communities, which is discussion groups. So we have an open forum and we're continuing to grow that with additional discussions and tags. And, and later this year, we're going to be developing um, some additional areas within community to help our members talk and generate ideas. We also have uh, events integration with our website where our members can book events. And then we have a member registry where our members can search for other, other members within um, the Institute and to get in touch with them directly. This addition will, will be added to the resource section of community. So our aim is to continue to grow this section of our um, platform to help our members be able to log in every day and to be able to connect with each other, generate ideas, and to be able to do their research in the design development phase of their projects prior to the specification um, phase for procurement. This is an example of one of our listings on the platform. So for the suppliers on the call and for our members, this will, I will take you through a little bit about what a listing inclusion will have. So each listing will have a large feature image. 
it will have it will include a website hyperlink directly to the product manufacturer's website. A product name and blurb will be included. A PDF download, which can include uh, product specifications and case studies. If um, product manufacturers have multiple documents, they can also link to their website where they have all of that information for easy access for our members. The category tags, which will help with the search functionality when our members are drilling down um, according to the area that they're looking for for their product procurement. The addition of the certifications and modern slavery register tags. If uh, the product manufacturer has a BIM library, we're going to include a hyperlink directly to their BIM library so that they can um, have easy access to the files and the contact details for the business in order to get in touch. So as um, Julia mentioned, we're planning to launch this in late October for our members. And if you have any further details or feedback on the platform, or you'd like to get in touch with me about having a listing, my details are on this page, but also um, we'll send you an email and follow up with a little bit more information if you'd like to learn more. Thank you, Julia. So I think we're going to now move over to the, the questions and answers. So feel free for people to pop in any questions into the chat box and we will be happy to help. Everyone's a bit shy today. <laughs> yeah, you can say Clara, Amanda. <laughs> Is everyone shy? Do we have any questions? Does anybody have any questions about materials? At what point is unpaid overtime considered modern slavery or is it? Good question. Yeah, it's Great a, question, Jess. A really good question. Um, and this is the most typical lawyer answer ever, but it depends. <laughs> you know, it, it's all a question of, of degree. Um, so... Yeah, that's absolutely one of those red flags that you're looking out for in the supply chain. If you keep hearing unpaid overtime or invoices are being missed, staff are not receiving their payments on time or at all, um, that's that's one of those situations where you might dig a little bit deeper. So it could be a sign that something's going on. It could be um, just something that you have a conversation about and move on. So yeah, it's definitely a question of degree there. Okay. Oh, they're coming through thick and fast. They are. This is great. I love it. <laughs> <That's great. laughs> um, okay. Okay. How many checks will we perform before you put a product supplier on the register and how much of this risk is reduced by this process? Thank you, Jonathan. So is it, I Amanda. think that this is in relation to the products and materials library. So in, in relation to any um, suppliers who supply, um, who give us a listing which includes a sustainable certification or modern slavery register. We have to have proof of evidence that they have a modern slavery register which will be hyperlinked on a um, platform. And if they have a product certification in order for us to use the tag for that product certification, they need to give me either a PDF of their certification for that particular product or a link to their website to validate prior to promoting. We're also, um, gosh, a system in place. So if any of our members do believe that the product manufacturer's um, details provided does not conform with what they're promoting, that there is a system in place for them to contact us and for us to put that listing in moderation until we've worked through the product supplier and validated if any information is incorrect. Fantastic. Thank you, Amanda. Another great one is, are there best practice references for modern slavery policies that we can use to inform our own policies? Georgia, I don't know if you want to respond to that, but I do know that, um, John, that one of the things that we will do is look to actually um, put together some CPD as well. So, um, and I'll pass over to Georgia as well. Yeah, no, I think those CPD resources developed within um, industry groups are going to be so valuable because this legislation is still fairly new in Australia. Everybody's trying to scramble to bring those resources together. Um, there are some good ones out there. A lot of different law firms are publishing um, sample agreements, sample policies and that sort of thing. Um, and, yeah, I'd really encourage you to have a look at the current public register and just have a look through some of the statements that have been made by um, some of the larger companies who've, who've had the resources to um, throw at, at law firms to, to develop 
different statements. Um, and it's it's one of those situations where everybody's going to learn from one another because it is a new initiative. Um, I don't think there's any any shame in going and seeing what everybody else is doing and, and picking the parts that, that seem most useful to you from there. And, and I'm sure we'll take full advantage of that as well, Georgia. Um, there's an interesting question there from Thibault, and I think um, the question is, uh, is, is relating to how deep into the supply chain does an architect's obligation mm. go? Um, so and I think that's, if I'm wrong, Thibaut, let me know. But I think that that's the question. So how deep do we, do? is it? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, no, I'll it's, it's definitely a really good question because I think, um, yeah, as a, a lawyer, I'm sitting in my home office sending off emails. It doesn't feel like I'm deeply engaged in a supply chain, but I am sitting here with my company computer and that's how I've logged on. So obviously um, we all have connections into those supply chains. Um, I don't think that in its current state, the legislation is obliging anybody to go off and, and track down every component in their, um, in their computers and different technology. Um, the focus of the legislation at this early point is on starting those conversations and building awareness and flagging what sort of issues, where are the risks going to be in your um, your own supply chain. So that may be one, um, but I don't think the, the AFP are going to be knocking on your door um, about the, the computers in your office, but it's just something, it's just one of those points to flag that we are all so interconnected in these different supply chains. We, we all are very much a part of a global economy. And there's a question, another interesting one, and this one is from Hamish, and it speaks to, um, you know, is the $100 million revenue trigger for statements, is that if you're a part of a, a and I think the question is part of a larger international mm. practice potentially that that may have a global revenue, is it, it will that trigger statements in Australia if you're turning over 50 million here, uh, but globally 300? Yeah, look, it's, it's another really good question. Um, at this point, the focus is on Australia, but we're finding that clients who are in that exact scenario where they're thinking, oh, we might be just under it for our Australian operations, but if we include the whole group, we're over, uh, tending to err on the side of caution and, and just get a statement in each year. Um, and, and different people approach it differently. Some people will do one for every single company in the group. Others just pull it all together and, and do it in one hit. Great. Another great question is about, is there a register, a global register for high risk, um, you know, uh, items that, that may be in the global supply chain? And I see that Nick's actually answered that computers oh, were great. identified as high risk. Thanks, Nick. Um, but if there, are, if, if there are any that you can say that there is a global register for risk analysis for product? Um, one that I came across in, in preparation for this was pulled together by a not-for-profit called Walk Free, um, and they have a, um, a report they produce that's called the um, Global Slavery Index, which is, is a good resource. But, yeah, I'm really keen if anyone else in the... Um, in the session has got any resources to drop into the chat, I'd be really keen. That'd be great. And, and Jai, what we might do as well is, is actually set something up in our community space and where we can actually, if we find any resources of that nature, we'll actually log them for you. So there'll be somewhere that you can actually follow through. So I'll give that to Amanda as something that we can follow up on as well. Uh, also, there's a question about are there any formal auditing requirements of annual statements? And, and I would think that that question is currently and, um, and I think you can actually put a forward piece to that as well. And if there's not, when will there be? Yeah, another good question, which I, I must admit, I don't have a um, complete answer <laughs> for at the answer. moment. Um, it's very early days at the moment. This legislation sort of focused on reporting the steps that you're taking now. Um, and I think that over time, it'll probably dig a little bit deeper and become more detailed. Okay. Um, Jesse is, is actually um, placing some emphasis on unpaid overtime and wanting a more definitive answer. I think, Jesse, that there's plenty of examples out there at the moment of um, restaurateurs and hotel operators who have been found in breach by not paying overtime 
and what is too much. I, I think that we might actually do a little work on this and come back to you with um, another session on um, when is over, unpaid overtime too much. Because I, I do agree with you. And there's, this has actually been a conversation that's been had by RIBA in the, in the UK as well. And it is uh, on some people's minds. I would definitely say that that is the case. We've got Graham from Canada. So he's asking, uh, he's unfamiliar with Australian law concerning modern, modern slavery. And in any case, one of the things that interests him is a relationship between this law and its inclusion in standard contracts between architect and construction contracts, including international contracts under the FIDIC. Very um, specific. Yeah. Um, the, I guess I can just speak to my own experience in, in the contracts that we've seen come across the desk. and often the way that it plays out is there might be a services contract between um, a landowner and an architect who's providing design services sort of at an early stage of a development and the the landowner or the developer who's procuring those services will throw a clause in the back end of the contract which says you know you will train your staff in modern slavery you will let us know if there's any red flags arising and that information helps the, the principal and the landowner um, to comply with their own obligations. Sometimes people push back and say, why are we even talking about this when we just came to do some design work? Um, is this an appropriate form? So it's in every business relationship, you'll have a different arrangement. But um, yeah, more and more people seem to be including it in their standard terms now. Great. And there's a couple of questions about uh, Victoria and how they're faring, how they're traveling. And the, there was another question as well, which I'll just answer before we go on to that. And it was a question specifically about, will we work with other organizations such as Property Council to actually develop a response? And that was from Kate. Kate, we work with a whole range of organizations uh, really frequently. And I would imagine that, yes, we will work with Property Council um, to actually look at what we're doing and how we're doing it um, as well, because we, we do talk quite regularly. Um, I do know Keen quite well. And uh, our organisations do, do actually do quite a bit of work together. So I would suggest that we all um, continuously have conversations on a range of matters at the highest level. So just to give you comfort. And Belinda has gratefully posted as well, thank you, Belinda, that we're actually working on an acumen note to provide guidance in this space as well. So thank you, Belinda. Uh, back to Victoria. Um, yeah. I'll, what's Victoria doing? Yeah, so Victoria at the moment, I'm not aware of legislation going through um, their parliament now. Um, so if you're operating in Victoria, potentially you're still under that Commonwealth Act. Um, having said that, just as you were chatting, Julia, I was doing a little bit of Googling and I've noticed that a lot of um, Victorian government departments do have modern slavery policies on their website. So it's obviously something that um, different parts of the government are looking at. And it may be that the New South Wales Act will be a test case. And if that gets up, then possibly other states will follow or they might just make the choice to use the Commonwealth Act instead. So yeah, watch this space for Victoria as well. Fantastic. And there's a note there from Angus as well to everybody. He's a, a board member of GECA and they have uh, they wanted to know that modern slavery is a criteria within their standard and their website has a list of licensees and products. Thank you so much for posting that. Really appreciate it. I think uh, and, Graham, and Hamish has also sent a note to Graham stating that uh, we're seeing it come through in service agreements now in Victoria and it's being added to client mandated conditions for mm. works contracts. So thank you for adding that as well, Hamish. What a community we have. <laughs> okay, there is one from Nick and it speaks specifically to Novation. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's Novation and my favorite topic. Mm. Uh, so how far do we need to push and insist that they should be using products that meet their own MS requirements? I would say pretty hard. 
it's, you know, innovation and um, moving product, you know, needs to come through with an agreement. And I, I know that we're working very hard on our uh, deed of innovation and our guidance notes to government all around the country, which are in final review at the moment. And, and hopefully that will assist government in their decision-making around innovation and um, best practice. Okay, Any, is there anyone I've missed? Oh, there was a question about the spike in 2016-17 uh, around other slavery cases. <laughs> and they were wondering, is that does that mean that there's a slippage from the main categories or uh, another form of something less known? <coughs> yeah, that's a really good question that um, I'm not 100% um, across, to be honest. Um, it may be that it's a new AFP division and they're just working through how they categorised the different options. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I'm going to go uh, and Yeah, I would suggest it's actually it's reporting. Really um, yeah, I would suggest that it's actually that they've just started reporting on something. Things don't generally just jump. Um, it, it's normally that there's been an adjustment in how they've been reported, but we will follow up and um, and come back to everyone. We'll take all the questions and probably come back with some written form to everybody as well on just what the next steps are around the questions. So thank you all very much. I don't think there are any more. If anybody has any other questions or if you'd like an early mark, put your hand up. Um, if not, <laughs> we'll... Uh, We'll call it quits for today and thank everyone very much for their attendance and their engagement. Um, thank you very much to Georgia. Thank you to Amanda. Thanks to everyone. And thank you for letting me host my first leaning. You did a Appreciate great job, Delia. Thank you. It was great to have you. you. Don't get out very much, gang. So <laughs> Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.